Estado e União da Pergunta, por conta de presidente do Estado pessoal. E as palavras que eu vou usar em Bonga, e minha amiga e minha amiga, e as perguntas para a Silvia. E eu quero agradecer o John também. Quite an honor for us to be associated with. Uh, for those who don't know, John it was a couple of years back. He got the prize for the ARC National Herd of the Year Award. That's all the herds in South Africa considered. Um, very, very strict uh, adjudication criteria, and he got that prize. And he's also had some elite cows and bulls. I can't remember all the prizes, but anyway. So, so it's really. Um, I'm humbled to be here, to be quite honest. And by the way, I also want your lecture. <laughs> Very great lecture. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to talk to you about performance recording. And I'm not going to prescribe. 90% of the information that you're going to see comes from stakeholders, agriculture stakeholders, and from farmers. We as scientists, we, we repackage it often. Like we repackage research into information that we get from farmers, by the way, and then that information goes back to industry to help industry. Okay, and I'm going to focus on principles. I'm going to skip slides here and there because I don't want to be more than 25, 30 minutes at the most. Okay, and you're going to, I'm going to try to convince you, not just convince you, to make you passionate about performance recording. It's a very simple but extremely powerful, if not the most powerful, technology out there. If you don't measure, you don't have data. If you don't have data of yourself, you will not know if you can run 100 meters under 10 seconds. Who's, 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 who's got a time for himself? Nobody. Maybe there can be Usain Bolt among yourself, but you just never measure. Okay. So I'm going to just um, put the, the, the industry in perspective for five minutes, and then I'm going to jump to real stuff about performance recording, the challenges as well as the opportunities. Just a quick one, agriculture production, 358 billion rand. As you sit here, there, you are contributors to this, to this value. Okay, the meat and the food there at, there at the back comes from farmers like you. Really, really important. Okay, so this very, very important when it comes to food security in South Africa. If there's no farmer, food security will be zero. And I'm going to show you some shocking statistics just now. Okay, I'm not going to go into all of this. Animal production specifically, 151 billion. Okay, um, gross value of the cattle and calves that were slaughtered in this period, 40 billion, more than 40 billion. It's a massive industry. And since the industry is so big, there's a lot of competition. If you're, not, if you're not profitable or competitive, you're gone, you're out. And I'll show you, and that's where performance recording comes in. Okay. Um, and it's been estimated, if we look at the potential of agriculture, specifically animal production, eh, we can add another 8.2 billion rand. So there's a lot of opportunities, despite the fact that there's lots of challenges. Okay, I always say a challenge always creates an opportunity. COVID, COVID pandemic created a fantastic opportunity for many people, amongst others, the people making the medicines. If you go read about how much money they made, single companies, you will not going to believe it. It's hundreds of billions of dollars, not rand. Okay, just as an example. Okay, so we, uh, John mentioned we have the latest stats. I must just tell you something. I love stats, but I don't know how to work it out. And what I always get from stats, depending who you talk to, which reference, stats as a rule differ from who you talk to. So sometimes you have to, some people will say there's 11, billion, 11 million cattle, other people say there's 14 million. 3 million is a massive margin. Okay, so I try to stick. I don't use, by the way, uh, Facebook statistics. I try to get it from real peer reviewed publications or organizations that's accredited. Okay. We have more than 40 cattle breeds in South Africa, lots of products, 
We have a lot of diverse environments, that's where these come in. Some people may tell you, some of the farmers, it's far too many. It's for you to decide, depending on what your, your goals are and which area in South Africa you farm. We slaughter more than 3 million cattle per year. Million, that's a lot. In the last 10 years, from 20, not the last 10, from 2010 to 2020, 10 million tons, not kilos, 10 million tons of beef was produced. It sounds like it can't be true, but all the stats say the same thing. And if you work out from, from this statistic, then you see it's actually true. I'm trying to, not to show you all the stats, but to picture the, the size of the industry where you are fitting in and you need to find a space somewhere. There's a lot of competition. Coming back to, again, why you need to performance record. Okay. That's that one, from 2010 to 2020, almost 10 million tons of beef. You can go work out what the money, monetary value of that is, it's, it's huge, okay. Okay, so for those of you that want to export, at the moment we export 4 to 5 percent. The aim is, if you look at uh, the, 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 the experts in the field, like the RPO, BFAP and those people, they say, we must grow it to about 20% in the next decade. That's a big jump, eh? but there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of factors that affect this, like foot and mouth and many other things, market forces, etc. Bottom line is a lot of opportunity here. Um, so we have about 60 million people in South Africa. Stats also differ there a bit, 60.3. And the farmers that feed these people, 40,000 roughly commercial farmers, some people say it's 30,000, some say it's 50, so I took 40, okay? Auto, almost a quarter of a million small-scale farmers and about 3 million subsistence farmers. Those are the people that put the food on my table every day and your table. Okay, the 60 million of us, by the way, that we, that we think there is. People will say there's probably more. The livestock sector, that's how important this farming sector is, supports about 13 million people directly. That's about a quarter of South Africa's population. If you take the livestock sector away, the agricultural sector, we will all die, to put it very bluntly, to be very honest. There will be no food. 13 million people directly being supported by the agricultural sector. This to me is a shocking statistic. This is a, a formal statistic from national as well as international bodies. More than one in five, about a year and a year and a half ago when I researched this, it was 23% of people is going to bed tonight. Many of them are children, no food. Did you know that? 23% of people are going us inadequately to severely inadequately no food. That's horrible if you think about it. Okay, and just coming back to the farmer, the, the important role that you have to play in terms of food security, national as well to a degree, household food security. Because if the market forces and all those things that affect it are not great, even if there's enough product, people can't afford it. And performance testing in a way really relates to affordability of a product. Okay, John touched on some of these things. I'm going to show you some stats on the uh, uh, feedlots in terms of feed conversion ratio. These are just all the farmers, just in a nutshell, the commercial farmer, which is about close to 60% of the farmers in South Africa, and the way they farm, highly competitive environment, of course. Then the emerging uh, uh, farmers, most of them, or many of them, lease land. Very different production system there. Eh? A lot of it communal land and things like that. Um, and then of course the communal farmers um, that use communal grazing. S relatively old statistic. Uh, shift my eyes again. That was 2019, 2021. The prediction was that the demand, and that's where you as the producer comes in, will go up by about 8%. Some other statistics show 13%. That's quite a, a, an increase. It, 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 
it looks like it's not big, but in statistical terms, in real terms as well, it's quite a big uh, increase in demand. And you have serious competition, KFC, Kentucky. Because of the price and other market forces and the feed and all those things, they're one of the biggest, uh, well, livestock-wise, they're the biggest sector, no? the, the chickens. And that's the demand is getting higher, one of the reasons being more affordable than beef. Again, coming back to performance recording, in the fairy tale world, I know we're in the human world, but in the fairy tale world, if you do everything right and there's performance recording and data for everything and you get paid for exactly the right kind of animal that was performance recorded, you should be much, much more competitive to other markets like the chicken market, for instance. Okay. Um, so what are the challenges? I'm not going to go through all of them because I want to bring it back to performance recording. The main challenge is unsustainable and unprofitable production levels. In other words, production efficiency is not closely what it's supposed to be. And that's all, not just in South Africa, especially in Africa and other parts of the world. And most of that is due to the fact that you don't have data. Okay. Um, Performance testing, absent in many instances. And performance testing is not necessarily fancy, expensive stuff. You just need a pen and a piece of paper and 10 minutes in the morning to see if a calf, if a cow coughed. And at one point, how much did the cow weigh? When did the cow, uh, what was the weaning weight of the calf and things like that. Okay. And this is the other one, and this links on to the market of the commercial slash uh, stud farmer. You're not in isolation. Still, there's too much separation, by the way, in my view. But there's huge disparities in terms of how the animals perform of the commercial sector versus the communal slash emerging sector. And I'm going to show you that just now. And that's costing the farmers and eventually the industry, millions and millions of rand per week, not per year, okay. Slow adoption, uh, John mentioned, and I don't think it's just the limbers in all the breeds. There's many farmers still in this age where people almost walk around on moths, almost, that still don't do performance recording. Okay, I think part of it may be, there's many reasons. One, if they start telling you you're gonna get 50 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever for every record you send, and people are going to think twice because of the power of money. But the bottom line is, it, it's still slow. Although people have been recording, they say in the biblical times already, there's some stories of how they checked out the, 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 the sheep and the goats with the horns and how they select it. That's performance recording in a way. But still now in 2023, and many people just don't, um, yeah. We can talk about that for a long time. Okay, um, let me just see. I'm not going to go into all of that. I spoke about the disparities, which links on performance recording, communal sector, and the small scale sector. And we know fertility, by far the most important one. No calf, no money. It's average 40% versus the commercial sector 61% versus the elite sectors, 85%. A lot of challenges, but also opportunities to get that up. Do you agree? That means only four out of 10 cows give calves. So what are you doing with the other six? I had a farmer that always asked, he said, did the cow calf? He says, no. Did you, did you sell her or did she become boltong or did you keep her? He believes strongly she be, should be built on like as soon as possible. Now I want to show you this. This, this one is about, I think 13 years, no, not that much. It's about 10 years old, 8 to 10 years old. Real statistics. I'm just going to look at the carving percentage, which is one of the most important ones. So in the previously disadvantaged sector, it was 40%, very low. Then they had a a special development program at the time. Dr. Baldwin Nengovela was in charge of that. And he showed within, I think, three to five years, how you can take this from 40 with all the right knowledge and the persuasion and 
getting them to adopt simple stuff. They're not doing anything space age there. They were only recording the basic stuff. When did the cow calf? Okay. You took them from 40 to 61 percent. In terms of monetary value, it's very, very big. If it was true for the whole of South Africa, I'm going to show you some real figures. What is the monetary increase if you can, if you can enhance uh, fertility in the national herd just now? Okay, but can you see what happened from 40 to 61? That's huge. It's 21 percent, lots, millions and millions of rand. The other one also, in terms of why people sometimes don't do performance recording, uh, and things like that, there's too, it's still they're too much in silos. Because at the top you have the seed stock producers, right at the bottom you have subsistence farmers, the one with the three or five animals maybe. And the genetics supposedly should flow from the top to the bottom. One of the problems is the people here don't talk to one another enough, not by far. To, Today is one of these events where people from different sectors talk to one another, share their experiences, share some advice and things like that. But by far, they don't link to one another enough. There are many people, if you ask them, who's the ARC or what is performance recording? What are you talking about? It should be, it, it should be logic, you know what I'm saying? Okay. This one I got, I think it was, but you may associate with this. Um, Lou Allen, also one of our um, previous winners, he said that oh, in his case at least, over 90% of the bulls that he sell go to commercial and emerging farmers. That's his market. It's not necessarily always another stud farmer. No? Okay, and then he said these farmers or breeders are, these people that buy from them are their bread and butter. You need to supply them with the right genetic material. And you will only know that if the animals have been performance recorded. Okay. So these are some of the uh, technologies, uh, the opportunities. Because the big thing is we need to improve productivity. You need to be more profitable at the end of the day. To be able to compete in your market. If you don't compete, the market is going to push you out. Okay. So we need to get all these technologies, especially the easy ones. The starter one is not genomics. It's a great technology, by the way, that the limousines were also involved with. But it's an up there technology for stud farmers. You must, must start with the most basic stuff, the pen and the piece of paper where you record when a cow coughed. Okay. We need lots more focus on training and skills development and things like that. I'm not going to go into all of that. And now the sector can be grown. Okay, um, so let's get back to the basics first. Why do we, and, and the following few is why do we need to record? And I'm glad we have Marius here today because I'm going to show stuff that he will be, can associate with just now. In terms of visuals, which is also important, structural efficiency is important. And the other thing is, I'm one of those people, if you put Visual is very important for many farmers as well. So you can have a Lamborghini here and a Ferrari. I will never ever take the Lamborghini. I just don't like a Lamborghini. For me, my brother says he will take it immediately if it was possible. It's too um, hookah, what is it in English? It's too squarish. Whereas the, the, um, the Ferrari is more smooth for me. It just tells you how important looks is also. Besides the fact that it must be structurally efficient, looks is also important. Some people don't like specific breeds for whatever reason, they like other breeds. That's all human, okay. So we want to get back to the basics quickly. And that comes to genetics. None of us are unique. Why am um, almost unique? Why am I saying this? As you sit there, you are 99,9% .9 related to me on gene level. Did you know that? I'm not exaggerating. Any animal on this farm 
is 99.9% on genetic level, I'm going to show you now how we discern, related to an animal in China. Did you know that? Can you see the challenge? How to use the minute small part, the information, to select between different animals, or humans for that matter. Okay. So the question is, are we unique? I'm very proud to say that I'm 99,9% .9 on genetic level related to this guy. <laughs> I don't think you will want to say that of me, by the way, <laughs> if it was still alive. Okay. So this one is for Marius as well. So just to, to demonstrate a principle, this is Jay Cutler and Eddie Hall. Okay? In terms of looks, if you had to go for looks and size, it's pretty obvious which one will be preferred. If this guy stands on a stage, uh, I don't know if he'll win any competition if he does this. Okay. This is the former Mr. Olympia. I think he won it four times. Olympia is the top of the top in bodybuilding. Massive guy. Perfect physique. So in terms of physique, structural, and like or not, by far the better one. By far. But you must never underestimate looks. Eddie Hall. What do you think this guy may be good at? Strong man. World strong man, he won it only once. So, then now you put them through a performance recording as an animal. This is a deadlift. Like, which one of these two? Look at this guy's size, guys. This is uh, um, Jay and Eddie. What do you think is the difference? 500, he didn't get anything on stage. Nobody liked him because he, looked, uh, he picked up his world record holder 500 kilos from the floor versus 300. Can you see the difference in looks as well as performance? I'm just trying to, to demonstrate something. You cannot see this. People looked at him um, when he stood there and said, oh, No, Eddie, you're not, getting, you're not going to get anywhere. Only guy to ever have lifted 500 from the floor. Okay. So looks can be very deceiving. So what's a rationale, another one behind performance testing? There's one, two, three, one, two, three, four cows there. Can you see genetics? Which one of these cows you think is a top performer? And which one do you think is not a great performer? Just take a guess. Which one looks like the one that you will not want? My dad was a looks guy as well, but it was many, many, many decades ago. You think that one? Marius, Lee does here. <laughs> Can you see they look pretty different? That's a Drakensberger and that one. They look pretty different. How do you know what is the reproduction of these cows by looking at them and their performance? You can't say. All f my, my, my dad would have slaughtered this one. All four of these cows were the top in South Africa of the entire breed at the time. This one about, I think, four years ago. These all last year, no? Elite Cow Award. To get an Elite Cow Award, the animal must have the best performance of all cows in the entire breed, in the entire South Africa. You would not have said this by necessarily looking at them. That's why in this particular class, looks don't count. We just look at performance figures. And then later on, of course, at one point, you must bring in looks as well. People don't one stuff that they don't like. That's how humans are. Okay. And it's the same with these bulls. Bottom line is, can you see things like feed conversion ratio and average daily gain? Two of the most, two of the three, well, the two together is one of the three 
most important profit drivers of a feedlot that affect how much you and I pay for our stake in checkers. Okay, you can't necessarily see it. I'm just going to touch on one or two. Why not? An animal, cattle specifically, have about 20,000 genes that do lots of different stuff, amongst others fertility, feed conversion, and disease resistance or susceptibility, and you can go on and on and on. Okay. And look at this one. Despite the fact that the animals are pretty homogenous when you have selected, especially applying performance recording, one bull, one cow has at least 8 billion different combinations that can go into the first calf and the second calf and the third calf. It's, un um, it's amazing if you think about it. And it's the same with humans. Humans much more. If you go do the research, they say with humans, for me and my wife, if we have another child, you can have as many as 10 to the 27, the power 27 different combinations of genetic makeup. It's like it can't, you will think it's impossible, it can't be. But it's true, they've worked it out and you can see how they do it. But look at all the possible with, with cattle. At least 8,000 million genetic combinations in a calf and the next calf and so on. And still they're very homogenous if you think about it. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into the rest. You can read the rest if you want it. Just a quick one on epigenetics. John touched on the, the uh, climate that's changing. Epigenetics is and you have, to a degree, a hold on it, what you feed your animal and the composition of the feed has an epigenetic influence. It means it can change, the, it doesn't change the DNA or the genes of your animals. It changes the way how they work. They've showed that with many things. There's some horrible, if I may quickly tell you one, they did a study, uh, there was, what is hungerslut in English? Yes, my English is bad today, sorry for that. Uh, hunger. There was starvation in the Second World War in the Netherlands. And the ladies that were pregnant at the time, because of the huge, uh, they didn't get all the uh, nutrition, the nutrients, their children were suffering from all sorts of things like, amongst others, diabetes and psychological, psychiatric problems, and their children also, because of the environment. In this case, it was food. And it's the same with feed and animals. So if there's a problem with the feed, there may be an epigenetic or heat, for instance. Ne? And it's already been shown with Prof. Scholz's uh, research. There can be a problem with the offspring. It doesn't change your DNA makeup. It just affects how it's performs, how it's expressed. Okay. Uh, I don't want to repeat too many things. Um, so most like, uh, just to come back again, no, most traits not visually quantifiable. I'm not going to go into all the rest because of time constraints. Uh, profit drivers, I'm not going to go into this. Let's look at real figures. This is the last five minutes. Real examples, so, so, what have, so what? What have performance recording done for industry? There are millions of examples. I can give you a million, but then you're going to sit here for another two years. You don't want to do that. Just to show you a few outstanding ones. In the United States, in the 19, roughly 1960s, it took eight pigs to produce a thousand pounds of meat. Now, it's actually now below five. Performance recording, selecting for more efficient animals. That's a massive increase, can you see, from eight to five. Okay, and one of the other big stories is chickens. 250%, that's huge, increase in feed efficiency since the 19, late 1950s. That accounts to billions and billions of dollars worldwide. Okay, these are real examples. Another one, this is one of France's. This is a real example. You take a cow herd of 100 cows, 
the meaning price is 35 I think it's now 37 or close to 37 but anyway let's say it's 35 65% carving percentage which is what the commercial herd looks like and then 180 average weaning weight so now you do performance testing you increase it with 10% the carving percentage and the average weaning weight with 10 kilos on this specific herd this is how much you make more in gross income almost 90,000 rand can you see that another one I want to come to this one because if I think in the fairy tale world if you had papers for all your animals maybe one day you should be compensated for by the feedlot how efficient your animal is why look at these statistics this, just a farm I'm not going to go into all of this 10% improvement in feed conversion can lead to 43% improvement in profit that's huge okay if you look at the South African feedlot conditions two of the most utmost important ones that affects their profitability okay and this is a real example this comes from the AMT you can't see here but all I'm going to tell you because it's a bit small two scenarios average daily gain of 1.7 versus 1.9 the rest is all the same it jumps from Yo, my eyes are bad from 950 rand to 1381 rand increase that's average daily gain if you add feed conversion ratio in here animals with great feed conversion ratios that jump is going to be much bigger even so in the fairy tale world the, the feedlot should compensate you if you have a real efficient animal and you will only know this if the animal was tested you will not know it otherwise okay some bigger predictions I'm not gonna go maybe they saying the, the, the agricultural economists they work this out they say if you only make a 1% per year improvement in carving percentage and winning weight after 10 years the industry would have gained 4.5 billion these are not spy, uh, it, although it's a prediction it's not a pie in the sky thing because they also look at what happened in the past how things changed okay this is a real one a real figure very old slide but it demonstrates a very valid point so they looked at all the breeds all the breeds that was on the national database from what is that my eyes again from 1960 to 2000 and they did this is not a prediction this is a real finding the average the calves weight how much you think it came up 52 kilogram gain you can make the sums 52 kilos over that period for all the millions and hundreds of millions hundreds of millions of animals that were slaughtered between there and there it's actually not billions it's trillions of rands increase in terms of this a more recent study from 20, 1970 to 2014 this was published as well it's not Facebook it was published that they showed if you invest in performance testing the return on investment is close to 32 percent now I know very little about economics but if I put my money in a bank or, or the bank comes to me and they say you're going to get 32 close to 32 percent I think I'll go borrow money maybe steal money sell everything I get and put it into that account for that kind of money okay some international people especially from the USA and Europe they make economic predictions that say genetic improvement which is only possible if you do performance recording can be as high the return on investment as 1 in 18 that's almost unbelievable if you think about it okay so for one rand spend on the long run you get 18 rand back extra okay I'm almost finished now really so without data 
I like this saying, people say, you just have an opinion. People say, where did you hear this? Where? Then you must back it up with data. Okay. We don't have information to tell us whether we're moving forwards or backwards if you don't have any information. That's why you really need to record. Okay. And that's also vital if you want to position yourself in the market. The market is very, you know that much better than me, is very competitive. So you need to stay profitable and sustainable and all those kind of things. Otherwise, the market forces will just push you away. Okay. Um, and remember, there's an increasing demand for beef specifically, which says, although there's a lot of uh, competition, there's a lot of opportunity for you as a, as a beef farmer. Okay. Um, we know from what I've shown you that performance recording have been shown to, to yield dramatic positive results. Okay. And then we need to, this is my last one, I think. We really need to communicate like today. I think scientists talk too little to farmers, way too little. We should talk to each other much more and all the other stakeholders involved. So everybody's on the same page. What are our challenges, but also what are our opportunities? Okay. Thanks so much. I think I'm finished. <laughs>